I don't know about you, but sometimes I get sick of the news. I'm not a big news watcher. I'm, I, quite often, I'm out of the loop. Unless it's good news. Because who doesn't like good news, right? But the thing about news is it's only relevant if we know the context. If I told you, good news, they're opening a new factory, your response might be, well, so what? But imagine if we lived in a town where unemployment rates were through the roof and families are struggling to make ends meet and we hear the announcement, good news, they're moving a business to town, they're going to hire hundreds of local workers. That's great news, right? News occurs within a context. In 2018, in Thailand, there was a, a junior soccer team. They had just finished practice and they decided to go and explore the local caves. This was a place where they'd go hang out frequently and some of you might be familiar with this story. There was 12 young men between the age of 11 and 16 and their 25 year old coach. And so they make their way into the caves as they so often did, exploring, having a good time, just hanging out with the boys. Little did they know what was about to take place. Heavy rain spell, and within minutes, this giant cave fills up and the boys are trapped. They disappear. They don't come home from practice. News goes out that there's 12 boys missing. And you can feel the desperation of the loved ones, wondering where they are, hoping that they're not actually in the caves. The hours go by and they still haven't found them. Feelings are getting more desperate. Hours turn into days. One day ticks past. Two days. Three, four, five. Still no news. Rescue teams are now in the cave, scuba diving to see if they can find anybody. Things are looking pretty grim. Six days. Seven days. Eight days. Nothing. We're losing hope. How could they still be alive? Day nine, good news, we found them. 12 boys in their coach, four kilometres into the cave system, resting on a rock ledge in a cavern now filled with water. They're alive, but now we have to get them out. How do you get 12 boys and their coach through a system of tunnels of raging waters when expert divers struggle to get through? when it was dangerous for them, when one of the rescuers looking for the boys actually lost his life. How do we get them out? They start concocting this plan. And one of these divers is actually an Aussie. He's an anaesthetist. I can't even say that properly. He specialises in putting people to sleep. <laughs> and he's also a hobby cave diver. And he comes up with this wild idea of putting the boys to sleep and diving them out. Because they wouldn't be able to teach them the skills to get out. They would panic. Expert divers, such as this Navy SEAL, summon gunmen, died. So how do we get these boys out? They come up with this radical plan. They're going to train these other divers to anaesthetise the kids, put masks on their face. Halfway through this four kilometre long journey, they'll have to pause in a cave that has air in it, jab them again to keep them asleep, and continue. This is wild. This might be crazy enough to work. And so they start this mission. And so we're waiting for the news. Desperately waiting. And the first sign, the first boy is out. He's alive, he's made it. Imagine the ecstatic nature of the family as they reunited. The second boy, the third, the fourth, the fifth. There's a documentary on this, and they get down to the last boy. They've got one mask left. But they're worried because the mask is too big for his face. There's a chance that it'll come off while they're swimming, and they won't notice, and he'll drown. But they don't have any option. So they continue with the plan. And I think by the grace of God, boy number 12 comes out of the cave. Good news, they all survived. This is an incredible story of the survival, an incredible story of the human spirit. Who doesn't like good news? And the reason I'm telling you this is because 
the gospel is called good news. News. Which means it's occurring within a context, within a story. And so for us to make sense of that, we need to know what the story is. Not only is it called news, but we're told that it's good. So we need to explore, we need to look back and go, what is the story? Why is this news and why is it good for me? We look back in the beginning. God creates humanity to reflect his goodness, to reflect his nature. God is a being who is in essence love. He's relational. And so he creates humanity, Adam and Eve, to reflect that love. And they're existing in this perfect nature, other-centered love. But it doesn't stay that way. You see, God put in the garden a bunch of trees that they could eat from to survive. He says to them, eat from any tree you wish, just not that one tree. If you eat from that one tree, you will surely die. And, and, and this leaves me scratching my head. You could, you could ask the question, well, did God set these guys up for failure? Because for those of you who know the story, we know that they ate from the tree. You know, what was, was he setting them up? Not if we understand how love works. You see, nature by defin- love by definition necessitates freedom. And so I think of this tree almost like a door. God was saying to Adam and Eve, you are not forced to be here. I've created this space for you. I want to exist with you. But if you want to leave, there's a door there. You are free to come and go. As, well, not come, but you are free to go as you please. Without this door, love is an illusion. They are either slaves or robots. But God, being a relational being, creates the human order with the potential to love. But with that potential to love, also comes the risk of rebellion. But God, it was worth the risk. It was worth it to be able to hear his created order Say, I love you, and it not be automated, for it to not be fabricated. So humanity falls. The relationship between humans and the divine is severed. And God initiates a rescue plan. Because without connection to the divine, the outcome is death. And not because God is there ready to smite them, but because of cause and effect. If you unplug a light from the power point, it goes out. If you restrict an airway, a person dies. If we are disconnected from the Creator, we cease to exist. And so God comes up with a plan, an intervention. And the plan is that He's going to send someone to liberate humanity through the lineage of humanity. He's going to replace the first son of God, Adam, with a new son of God. And so anticipation builds. We're waiting for this Son of God. And eventually he comes. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary. The Son of God because he didn't have an earthly father, just like Adam did not have an earthly father. His father was God. Jesus, the Son of God, in the same way, born of God. And what God is doing here is he's relaunching humanity Because humanity is trapped in a desperate situation where they will perish unless God intervenes. We we inherit from our, our parents, from our ancestors, many things. You see, it all runs in the family. We pick up our genes from them. We also learn behaviours as well. When when I was a, a young fella. I remember going to my dad's work. He's a, an owner driver, a truck driver. And I would go along with him because I just love spending time with my dad. And I remember this one time when I was walking along next to my dad and one of the blokes that worked in this truck yard started laughing. And, and to help you understand why he was laughing, my dad's got a pretty crook back. And so when he walks, he's got a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a swagger. But as a, as a young fella, here I am walking along, nipping at his heels, just this little guy just... And, and so this guy starts laughing. He's like, he walks just like you. And there's nothing wrong with my back, but I wanted to be like Dad. We pick up these things from our families. 
both inherited and learnt. Adam was supposed to pass on his reflection of God, his reflection of love to his children. When he rebelled and he chose to leave that relationship, he no longer possessed that. He couldn't pass it on. And so his children and his children's children inherit brokenness. They inherit unrighteousness. They inherit rebellion. And that's passed through the generations. Hurt people hurt people. And so we need a new Adam enter Jesus. Jesus comes as the new son of God and he lives in a perfect relationship. He sees the doorway and chooses not to leave. He chooses to live other-centeredly, loving with his whole heart, putting others first. At no point in his life did he ever put his needs before someone else's. He was the human manifestation of what perfect love is. And then he goes to the cross and takes on our brokenness, our woundedness, which we inherit from our forefather Adam, which we contribute to through our own learnt behaviours. He takes that on as if it's his own, wearing it as if it's him, and dies. A dead rebel no longer rebels. When sin is put to death, the sinner no longer sins. There's a disconnect. You see, God was in this position where he he needed to perform this surgical procedure in order to remove what he loved the most, humanity, from what was destroying humanity, sin. And the only way to do that is death, and it was either our death or someone in our place. But when Jesus takes this on, the the story, the good news, as he dies in our place, is that death could not hold hold him. Because death had no say on him. Because he was perfect. And so, literally, death could not hold him in the grave. It wasn't capable of doing it. And so he's resurrected as the new head of humanity. And so, by default, We are all descendants of that first Adam. You didn't have a choice in that. That's what we're all born in. As as a descendant of Adam, we hurt. And we hurt others. And unless someone intervenes, unless someone comes and gives us this rebirth, we will perish. But by choice, God-given choice, the last of human freedoms, the ability to choose, we can align ourselves with the second Adam a fresh start, a new humanity, humanity 2.0. And from that second Adam, we inherit righteousness. We get his free gift of grace. We inherit a relationship with our heavenly Father, connected with the divine once again, so we can then function as we were designed. That's why they call it good news. This is something that's open to every single human that was ever born. Just as every single human that was ever born is a descendant of that first Adam. Christ made it possible for everyone to be redeemed in the second. Just like those boys trapped in the cave, we're given a choice. They didn't have to accept assistance. They could have stayed there. They could have perished. We don't have to accept what we're offered from Christ. We don't have to accept life. We don't have to accept freedom. We don't have to accept new identities. It won't be forced on us because you can't force love. God will honour your free will. But he desperately pleads, let us help you. You're going to drown in the cave. It's going to fill up. You can't live here. Let us help you. But unlike the plan in the cave, which was fraught with risks, and wasn't a certainty. We rest on the accomplished fact of what Jesus has already done, past tense. Hence why it's news and not advice. Advice is if you read your Bible, go to church, you will be saved. That is not the gospel. The gospel is news because it's saying Jesus has done something in the past which makes the present different. 
Reality is different. And what these two young men are doing today is stepping into reality. As they step into that baptismal font and they accept that Jesus' death was on their behalf, as they are lowered into the water as if they are dying, that old man is being crucified. And when they rise up out of the water again, they're being resurrected to newness of life. And they can boldly say, we are unapologetically royal, not because of us, but because of Jesus. And this is something that is offered to each and every single one of us. And heaven celebrates today two young men are accepting redemption and salvation. It's offered to all of us freely. This is just as if we've been offered a bank card with millions of dollars on it. You've been given it $2 million cash, all you've got to do is go tap, buy whatever you want. That bank card is no good to you if you don't use it, if you don't access it. And all of us are given access to life, to a new identity, to freedom, so we can boldly say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So we can boldly say, I'm a child of God, a descendant of the second Adam, a part of the new humanity. I'm no longer that old person. And today we celebrate as two young men make that decision. It's an exciting day. And, and I just want to urge you to consider making that choice for yourself if you haven't already. I want you to celebrate the choice you've made if you've already made it. If we've made it, we stand here in freedom. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. Condemnation has already happened. My encouragement is that each one of us here would be able to walk in freedom, just as Gabe boldly said, he's going to continue to be walking in freedom. Amen.